you ever thought to yourself, why are some people so different from me? In fact, why are some people so odd and strange? Has it ever struck you? What? Why is it that some people, when they talk, they gesture and they're loud talkers and their hands are everywhere? It seems like they've never met a stranger. And, and you, you could believe them if they tried to sell you a space heater in Arizona in July. But then there's other people who are withdrawn and stay back in their reserve. Why are they like that? Have you ever had a friend who would help you, it seems like, with absolutely anything? They would drive you to the airport, and who would do that? They, they arrive early for parties to help you st uh, set up and stay late to help you take down. They would even help you move, and you think, man, I need to be a friend like that, but you're not. Or do you have a friend who's always the life of the party, and it seems like they're planning their next adventure every time you see them, and you think, I want to live like Bob. I want Bob's life. But the problem is you can't stay up past 9 o'clock at night. You hate flying on airplanes, and you wouldn't bungee jump if somebody put a gun to your head. Or do you have a friend who's a creative? They paint. They like art. They make art. They can play the guitar. They write lyrics and prose for poetry. They even play the flute. And you think, one day I'm going to be creative just like them. But you can't pull yourself up off the couch where you're watching Netflix and playing Fortnite. And why is that? I think God, here's what we miss sometimes, is that God has made us in this world incredibly diverse and unique. That there are, there are so many kinds of people that he made. And it's good and it's beautiful. Here's the thing. So in this series, we want to help you see that everybody will have their strengths and everybody will have their weaknesses. In this series, we hope that you understand yourself better and you understand God and you understand other people better as well as yourself. And in this series, we hope it draws you closer to God. As Josh said, there's this ancient tool that has been used by Christians for centuries called the Enneagram. And the Enneagram is this. It's an ancient personality typing system that's developed by the early fathers really 1,700 years ago by the Desert Fathers to help you understand who you are and what makes us tick. The word Enneagram comes from the Greek word uh, Enya means nine. Uh, gram comes from their word from the Greek grammar, which means to write something down. We get the word grammar, grammar from that. But for centuries, spiritual directors, pastors, Christian counselors, Christian professors have been using the Enneagram as a tool to help people understand themselves and to understand others better, as well as, and most importantly, help us grow in our relationship with God. About a year ago, Josh started to say to me, hey, Palmer, you need to take the Enneagram test. It's, it's, it's changed me. It's helped me understand people more. And I'm like, yeah, Josh, great idea. I don't have time for that, Josh. It seems like nonsense. But then he walked in my office about six months ago, and he handed me this book, The Road Back to You. And a, and a friend of a friend of mine, Ian Cron, wrote it. And so I started to read it. And chapter after chapter, it opened my eyes first to to my own family and then to understanding them better and then help me see my own weaknesses to be and be honest about those and then help me understand that the staff that I work with every day here at the Grove better and helps me understand some of you better. And so then I ask our staff, we bought a copy for all of our staff and we said, you need to read it. And, and for the last two or three months, not only have they been reading it, but now they're identifying each other. Call, and not, not just calling them out, but now they're saying things like this. I know what my deadly sin is. Well, who says this? Who says that? But now they are. And then we thought, well, we need to invite the entire Grove to read the road back to you. So by the way, not only are we doing this teaching series, we have a pile of these books in the lobby that we want to invite you to take home with you. I reached out to Ian, Ian Cron, and said, would you give us just a word of welcome and speak from your heart about why the Enneagram is so important for the Christian to go through? So watch this with me. Just a, a Hey, minute. Grove. I'm Ian Morgan Cron, the author of The Road Back to You, an Enneagram journey to self-discovery. Soon, you're going to be on The Road Back to You, on which you're going to discover a whole lot more about yourself than you can imagine. But you're also going to learn about how to overcome those old self-defeating patterns of behavior that have long stood between you and the person you know God wants you to become. Speaking as a pastor and counselor, I can tell you I've never ever worked with a better spiritual formation tool than the Enneagram 
And I'm excited for you as you go journey on the road back to you. Happy travels. Happy travels. Thank you, Ian. In the Bible, Paul, the apostle, writes about how unique God has made each of us. So if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll use this as our text as we start this morning. Paul writes in verse 12, and he uses the physical body as, as an example of our diversity. He says, just as a body, the, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jew or Greek, free or slave, we are all given one spirit to drink. And even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you has a part in it. Paul's point is it takes all kinds. The Enneagram is this tool to help you see that God has made you unique. And the, the Enneagram not only does that, but it's unique from all other, I think, personality systems out there, identifying systems out there, because the Enneagram specifically, its goal is to help us grow in our relationship with God. So I have here, the ultimate goal of the Enneagram is to help you grow in your relationship to God. That's the core. That's the reason for it. You'll understand your need for the Enneagram if you understand what Paul writes in Romans. In Romans chapter 7, he said this, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what is hate. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. Ah, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Have you ever had those thoughts? Have you ever had those feelings that there are things that you know you shouldn't be doing, but you do it anyway? Ian Cron writes this in The Road Back to, to You, that Enneagram is full of wisdom for people who want to get out of their own way and become who they were created to be. That's what we hope you can do through the course of this series. What we don't know about ourselves, it will harm us. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well, what's the point in self-awareness? Why does it matter that I understand themselves? Because what you don't know about yourself, it will harm you, it will hurt people around you that you love, and it will damage your relationship with God. Let me use this as an example. Maybe you are not self-aware that you have this tendency to lose your temper. But when you lose your temper, it puts a barrier between, when you lose your temper, it hurts your sons or your daughters. It hurts your husband or your wife. When you lose your temper, it will get you fired. That's what happens. And then here's the problem with losing your temper. It creates this barrier between you and the people that you love. You keep losing it. You're not even aware that it's a problem. But your spouse or your children, they have a really hard time loving you because you keep going back to this destructive tendency. And so a barrier is there. It puts a barrier in your friendships in the same way that destructive tendency puts a barrier in your, in your relationship to God and keeps it from being being the best relationship that it can possibly be. If we are not aware of how God made us, we'll continue making the same mistakes and have the same regrets and do the same destructive things. I think there are two tendencies that we tend to gravitate towards as human beings. The first is, and I have them on the screen here, we try to be somebody we are not, but we think we should be. Have you ever found yourself thinking, if I could be more like her, or if I could be more like him, people will like me more? And so we become actors. We start to pretend like we're someone we are not in the hope that maybe we'll get a raise or we'll make more friends, and we end up wearing a mask. And that's not the authentic you. In this series, we're going to help you embrace the you that God made you to be. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else. Here's another tendency. We try to make somebody else 
who they were not made to be. Have you ever found yourself thinking that, man, I think I can fix them? Don't raise your hands. It's rhetorical. But have you ever tried to fix somebody? Some of you are fixers here. Maybe you tried to fix a husband or a wife or a fiance or a son or a daughter or an annoying co-worker. We try to fix people all the time. And we think, why in the world are they doing it that way? It's the wrong way. And then we end up saying this. We say, what's wrong with them? My wife told me about 10 years ago, because she saw that when I got frustrated with my sons, I would say that sometimes. I would say, what's wrong with you? And she said, Palmer, you can't say that. You hurt their hearts. There's nothing wrong with them. You just don't understand them. She told me that. But can I, in my own defense, because I'm reaching quite a ways back, just tell you why I said it the last time and then I quit. But what happened is I had asked one of my sons to mow the lawn. He was like in ninth grade and, and finally made him get up off the couch and, and say, it's your week to mow the lawn. And physically I had to help him get out the door to mow the lawn. Well, he comes back in, he's done. And then I go outside to wash the car and I grab my hose and my hose is shredded in half, not cut in half. It's like it's gone through a wood chipper. And I'm looking at it going, what could have possibly happened to my hose? And then it hit me. The kid ran over my hose with a lawnmower. So that's why I went in the house and I said, you ran over the hose with a lawnmower. What's wrong with you? You know, that's why I said that. So I've quit saying it, but that's why I said that. And he just mumbled, uh, yeah, dad, I, th I thought the mower would clear the hose. That's what he said. <laughs> Honestly believe that or he was trying to punish me, one of the two. But there's nothing wrong with him. We've realized he, he needs more notice in life than most people. But here's the thing. <laughs> we in this series want to help you honor the unique way that God has made, not just you, but the people that you love around you, the people that you interact with every day, your spouse, your, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your best friends. And we want you to see that God has designed you unique and beautiful. I want you to gravitate towards that person. I think that through the series, as we begin to see the strengths of others and our own weaknesses, I think it will lead towards stronger marriages. I think when we can see our own strengths and weaknesses and be aware of that. I think that we will understand our coworkers better and they'll be less annoying. I, I think teachers will be more patient and understanding and give more A's and fewer D's. I think that all those things will happen. So here's where we're gonna start. We're gonna try, I said there's nine Enneagram types. We're gonna try to make our way through all nine because I, wanna fe I want you to feel like you're part of the conversation and at least have a working understanding of this. And so we're gonna start with number one. Number one is the perfectionist or the principled person. Uh, the per the, a one is a very rational person. It's the person who cares about virtue. They are called the reformer because ones feel like they've been put on a mission by God to find what is out of order in this world and put it back in order. If they walk into a room and they see things are sloppy, they want to make it. They want to get it right. If you're wondering if you're a one or not, maybe, for example, you were in grade school, third grade, and your teacher lined you up to go to recess, and then you dove over to the drinking fountain, and the girl in front yells at you, hey, Bob is at a line over here. She's a one. She's definitely a one. <laughs> Ones care about order. Ones care about doing things right. Ones are precise in the things that they do. You want a one handling your taxes and doing your finances. Uh, ones have high moral standards. Some call them the good person. Uh, ones, because they're so conscientious, they make great lawyers and doctors. The problem is when ones are not so healthy, they go on a mission trying to fix other people and they can become critical. Uh, but when ones are, are healthy, they're conscientious and they're ethical. Uh, for example, I, I, I knew one man who said that in his entire life, He's never driven over the speed limit. <laughs> he's definitely a one. I don't know what's wrong with him, but I know he's a one. <laughs> Paul in the Bible is an excellent character study on ones. Because if you think about it, Paul was a judgmental Pharisee. By the way, the Achilles heel of a one is that they are judgmental. They will judge when they're unhealthy. Uh, 
But Paul is, is such a judgmental one, so concerned about lawbreakers that he's ready to kill them. That's an extreme one. That's when he's unhealthy. But then God gets a hold of him, and God takes his best qualities, and then, and then Paul starts to go on a mission to move people towards righteousness because he cares so much about one, one's. The trouble that ones live with sometimes is that they have an internal critic. And if you're a one, listen to me on this. You need to silence that internal critic. That internal critic can keep saying, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. You're not good enough. And I want to remind you today that you are healthy ones. When they're at their best, they are wise and they are discerning. They make very mature, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's a one. If you're not a one, maybe you're a two. Twos are called the help, the helper or the helpful person. I have a friend who has a neighbor, a good friend of mine, and he said his neighbor that he used to have, he called him super neighbor. I said, well, why'd you call him super neighbor? He says, because he was super. Listen to this, Palmer. He said, uh, on Mondays, I never had to worry about the trash. You know, he was Johnny on the spot. On the spot. 5 a.m., he's taking out the recyclables. He's taking out the black can. And Monday night, he's taking them back in even before I'm home for work. He said, super neighbor, when he's mowing his front lawn, he just buzzes over and mows my front lawn. That's a good neighbor. That's super neighbor. He he said, true story, he said, one time I, I came out to get in my car in the morning to go to work and super neighbor is kneeling by my car. I said, super neighbor, what are you doing? He says, he says, well, super neighbor said, I was going for a jog and I saw you had a flat tire. So I got my jack, I jacked it up. I pulled out a nail and I plugged it. And then I just brought over my pump. I just finished it, pumping it up. Boom, you're ready to go to work right now. <laughs> That super neighbor is a helper, and I need a neighbor like that. You know, everybody needs a helper as a neighbor. Uh, here's the thing. You know that, that you're a, a two, uh, for example, if when you were in maybe fifth grade and you played rec soccer and the coach called everyone around at, and it practice was over and you said, hey, coach, can I go pick up the cones and get, gather up all the balls? You're probably a two. Twos are known for being generous. Some call them the befriender. They're loving and gracious and caring. Twos are nurturing. They, they say that people are drawn to twos like bees to honey. Uh, twos are the embodiment of the of the mother that everyone wishes they had, okay? She's, a, for example, maybe your mother was a two if every day when you came home from school, she had warm chocolate chip cookies on a plate and a glass of milk. Your father was a two if he built you a tree house and coached every sport you ever played. Or maybe your friend, you know, is a two if, if you've had the flu and they show up with a, a big pot of chicken noodle soup. Twos in the Bible, twos can be unhealthy when they try to get something back for being a helper. For example, in the Bible, in Luke chapter 10, we read about Martha. And Martha is helping. She's a helper and she's cooking. But then she gets angry because she's not getting something back in return. Twos need to guard against uh, being overbearing and people pleasers. But when twos are healthy, they will be the friend that you always wish you had. Maybe you're a two. If you're not a two, maybe you're a three. Uh, threes are known as the effective person. They get things done. They are the achiever. Uh, threes are confident and self-assured. Threes become good leaders. Uh, threes work hard to be successful in whatever they do in life. They're called the achiever because threes can and will achieve great things in this world. Some call threes the stars of, of, of the human race. Uh, famous threes include Muhammad Ali, Elvis, Jamie Foxx, Oprah Winfrey, and Winfrey. Threes clearly do well in the entertainment business. Richard Rohr, who writes widely on spiritual formation and on the Enneagram, he writes about Jacob, and he says, in the Bible, Jacob embodies an Enneagram type in the three more than any other person in Scripture embodies any Enneagram type. He said he's a classic three. He said, for example, even in the womb before Jacob is born, he's fighting for position with his brother, trying to get out first is what we read. And then once he's out, he comes out second, but he's not satisfied. He wants to steal his brother's position, steal his birthright. And to do that, 
He pretends to be somebody he's not. That's a classic problem among threes. And then not only that, he dreams about a ladder that he wants to climb. But when threes, that's an unhealthy three, a lot of what we see in Jacob. But when threes are healthy, they are self-confident. They have great energy. They make good leaders and they get things done. If you're hiring people, you might want to hire a three. Uh, Number four, fours are known as the creative person or the individualist. Fours are known for wanting to be special and unique and stand out. Fours pride themselves in not being like anybody else out there. Fours fundamentally see themselves as different than anyone else. Fours are creatives. One spiritual director said that she was sharing with one of her clients. She said, I believe, I'm quite convinced, you are a four. And it's when she explained that she was a four, and there are millions of other fours in the world, this woman started to weep in her office, she said. She said, because I thought I was the only person like me out there. Don't tell me there's other people like That's how much fours want to be unique. That's why they're called the individualist. I said fours are creatives. They, they love imagination, for example. I think I have a nephew who's a four because he's in college right now. And every day of college, when he shows up for class, he wears a cape. I'm not making this up. He's not in kindergarten. He's in college and he wears a cape. He's, I'm, he's most definitely a four. Four is like, like I said, imagination. They like creating. They don't mind solitude. They like Lord of the Rings and Comic-Con. Those are fours. Fours are not turned off by melancholy. They don't mind that. Uh, They don't mind sad songs or sad movies. Uh, In the Bible, we have a number of fours. Job is one of them. We know Job is one because he laments quite a bit. Let me read to you what Job says, just a few lines. Job chapter 3, obliterate the day I was born. Blank out the night I was conceived. Let it be a dark hole in space. May God above forget it ever happened. Erase it from the books. Verse 4, rip the date off the calendar. Delete it from the almanac. Oh, turn that night into pure nothingness. Job is a four. Do you see that? He doesn't, like, he doesn't mind dark things. Sometimes if you know a four, you might think they are aloof. They are just being unique. Fours will not follow the crowd They want to be an individualist. But here's what I love about fours. Fours are deeply creative. They love art and beauty. They express their emotions by painting or writing music or learning how to play an instrument. I love or doing theater. I love that about fours. Maybe you're a four. If you're not a four, you could be a five. The five is called the wise person or the investigator. Fives crave insight. They live curious. Fives are learners. They're driven by logic and knowledge. They, they want to learn something new, it seems like, every day. Fives want to understand how the world works, whether it's the microscopic world, whether it's the cosmos, they want to learn about it. Uh, they want to learn about biology and theology and kinesiology. You name it, they're interested in it. This kind of describes a five for you. They say that uh, for fives, a day without learning is like a day without sunshine. In the book of Luke, or I'm sorry, Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, is a classic five. Uh, He is, we also believe he's a doctor, but he's also a five. Uh, Let me read to you what he writes. Turn in your Bibles if you want with me. And he opens his book with these words. He says, dear friends who love God, Several biographies of Christ have already been written using as their source material the reports circulating among us. Just by the way he writes, you can tell he's a five. He says, from the early disciples and other eyewitnesses. However, it occurred to me that it would be well to recheck all these accounts. So he's doubting everyone else. He wants to dig into this for himself. From first to last, and after thorough investigation to pass this summary on to you, to reassure you of the truth of all you are taught. Luke is clearly a five. Luke is an investigator. Do you see that? Other famous investigators include Bill Gates, Albert Einstein, Mark Zuckerberg, Jane Goodall. You're in good company if you're a five. If you're hiring, you want to hire a five. They tend to be smart people and get things done. If you're not a five, it's possible you're a six. Sixes are known as the loyal person. 
Sixes are fiercely loyal to their friends and to the things that they believe. In the Bible, we have a couple of examples of sixes I wanted to share with you. One is Ruth. So Ruth's uh, mother-in-law is Naomi. And Naomi is planning to go back to her home country. And she says, Ruth, you stay here. I'm going to leave. And Ruth says, no, not so fast. Ruth says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Ruth is clearly a loyalist, clearly a six. How about Peter? Peter's in the New Testament. And Peter said, so Jesus has said, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to turn your back on me. Peter says, no way. He says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to jail and even to die with you. Peter is clearly a six. He's loyal. He is so fiercely loyal that not only does he say he will die for him, he tries to walk on the water and almost does die with him. And not, not only that, he, someone tries to arrest Jesus and he cuts their ear off. Six is when they're healthy, they bond with others and form deep relationships. But sixes need to guard against this. The loyalist needs to guard against the feelings of anxiety and the lack of self-confidence to think, I can't do it on my own. Sixes seem, when they're unhealthy, will be reaching out to someone, a leader or a person to grab onto to validate them. And if you're a six, you don't need that, uh, especially if it's an unhealthy relationship. All right, moving on to sevens. Sevens are known as the enthusiastic person or the enthusiast. Sevens are full of joy, they're extroverted, they're optimistic. If you're planning a dinner party, make sure you, you invite a seven. Seven will keep, sevens will keep the conversations going. They'll pull out the bingo and uh, 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 categories or something. But sevens will always make the, uh, the dinner a party. Sevens live with fear of missing out, missing out FOMO. Uh, they, they find everything in life energizing. Unhealthy sevens or sevens need to guard against overindulging. They do have a tendency to do everything too much. There are a number of sevens in the Bible, and, uh, and I'll add to that. And because of that, addiction comes easy to sevens. They need to watch out for that. But when, you, when, when I say overdoing things and doing things too much, in the Bible, we have a classic example in Solomon. So, and why do I say Solomon is an, is an example of a seven? Solomon, A, he had 700 wives and 300 girlfriends. That's just overdoing it a little bit, I would say. I would say that's more than one person can handle in life. But sevens, when they are healthy, they are full of joy and they're resilient and they are inspiring to be around. All right, our next one, number eight. Maybe you are an eight. Eights are known as the strong person. Eights are the challenger. Eights are determined. They are confident and strong-willed, and they are passionate. When eights are at their best, they pull other, people's up, other people up. They help others do better. Eights fight for justice. They become advocates for the powerless. Eights, though, can be over-demanding and intense and insist on their way. The, the motto of an eight is this, act now, apologize later. Eights are the don't complain, don't explain, don't make excuses kind of people. Eights, if you want to understand an eight, uh, eights don't, don't have to be in control, but eights do not like to be controlled. There's a big difference there. I'll say it again. Because maybe you're married to an eight, or maybe you work for an eight, or maybe you've employed an eight. Eights don't have to be in control, but they don't like anybody trying to control them. Eights, when they walk into a room, you can feel their presence. You can feel their presence before you even hear them or see them. I have a, a good friend who's a strength and conditioning coach uh, with the Chargers, and I've seen him, I think his name is John Lott. I think he's a classic eight. And John Lott, I've been in locker rooms with him. And when you go into an NFL locker room, it's a room full of alpha dogs. Everybody thinks they're in charge, right? But when John Lott walks into the room, he's the alpha dog of alpha dogs. Everybody else gets quiet and everybody listens to John Lott because John Lott's an eight. Uh, eights, when they're unhealthy, here's their unhealthy tendency is to lose their tempers. Samson in the Bible, they say, is a classic example of an eight. 
Not because he was physically strong, but Samson got things done. Samson was a judge. Uh, We know that Samson also, there wasn't anything he didn't believe he could take on. He killed a lion with his bare hands. He killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. But we know he was an eight because his girlfriend Delilah kept saying, Samson, tell me what makes you so strong. Tell me what's going on that makes you so strong. But, But here's what the tendency of every eight, they don't want to tell you about what's on the inside. So he keeps, he keeps refusing to tell her how he ticks. Finally, finally, he's vulnerable enough. This is really hard for an eight to be vulnerable. And he says, okay, it's my hair. It's my hair that gives me the supernatural strength. And do you know what she does? She stabs him in the back like Jezebel. That's what she does. And they, ki- they don't kill him. They poke his eyes out. And his worst fears, the eight's worst fears come true. And that, and, that, and that Delilah takes this secret of his and she uses it against him. That's what every eight fears. Unhealthy eights, they struggle with their temper. They resist vulnerability. But when eights are healthy, they are natural born leaders. They get things done. When other people think something cannot be done, an eight will get it done for you. Well, we have one left. So if you haven't seen yourself yet in one through eight, maybe you're a nine. The nine is known as the peaceful person. Uh, More than any other Enneagram type, nines want peace in their life. They want peace internally and they want peace in their relationships. They will do almost anything and sometimes to a fault to maintain peace. Uh, Nines are peacemakers. It's good to be around a nine. Maybe there's someone in your office who you love sitting in their office, in in their space, because they, they will let you talk about your problems for hours. They're most likely a nine. Everybody needs a friend who's a nine. They say that when you're sitting down with a nine, it feels like you're sitting by a warm fire in winter, sipping hot cocoa with a Snuggie wrapped around you. That's what it's like to be with a nine. We all need nines in our lives. Nines are gracious. Nines are understanding. Nines make lifelong friends. Nines you can count on. It's good to be a nine. We all need a nine. So those are the nine personality types in the the Enneagram. I hope you have an overview understanding of them. I want to end with this thought, though, that no matter where you land on this Enneagram scale, whether it's a two or a six or a five. I want to remind you this morning that you are made in the image of God. Don't try to be someone else. Don't think it's better to be someone else because each of these personality types uh, are embodied in God. God embodies every one of these. And so you reflect, some say the Enneagram is a mirror to the soul. You reflect the best qualities of God, whether you are a nine or a five or a one, you reflect God. I've written, just to remind you of this, I've written a few things down about each of these types. Ones remind us of God's perfect nature and his desire to restore the world to its goodness. Two show us God's grace and selflessness. Threes remind us of God's glory that shines like the stars. Four show us a creative God who made the world incredibly complex and interesting. In fives, we see God's wisdom and his limitless knowledge and understanding. Sixes remind us of God's everlasting love that never stops. In sevens, we see the joy of the Lord and the adventurous life he has for us. Eights demonstrate the strength of God and his desire for justice. And nines remind us to be God's apostle of peace.